Hey, y'all, I'm Angie Thompson, and this is the Fishing Business Podcast. I'm so glad you're here today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with, with me and hopefully to learn some new things today. And I tell you what, I've got somebody really interesting and unique that I want to introduce you to today. His name is Johnny Schultz, and I met him in 2003 when he was eight years old, and he had won the Bassmaster Casting Kids Contest at the Bassmaster Classic in New Orleans that year. Now, we used to have at BASS, there used to be this program called Casting Kids, which was kind of like punt, pass, and kick for... Uh, fishing. So we would teach kids how to pitch and how to flip and how to cast. And then um, the, the Federation Nation members from around the country would put on these competitions. And then the kids that won the state would come to the classic and compete there. And Johnny won his age group when he was eight years old in 2003. And I'm telling you, I think he might have come to every classic after that. And um, I would see him every year and, and got to know his parents. And uh, I just knew that Johnny was going to be something in the sport of fishing one day. And he is, but not in the way that you might think. Johnny's actually a YouTube star. Now, he, he may not say that. He's probably too humble to say that. He's like 25 years old now, has a huge following on YouTube and actually earns his living fishing on YouTube. So you're going to really find some interesting things here, I think. We're going to meet Johnny next on the Fishing Business Podcast. Johnny, you and I have known each other for a long time. I remember the very first time I saw you was at the Bassmaster Classic, and I think it was in New Orleans. Did you go to New Orleans when you were just a little kid? Yeah, that was the first classic I went to back in 2003, and I was there right. for the Casting Kids National Championship. I remember meeting you there with your parents in the elevator, and you made such a great impression on me. And of course now, well, why don't you talk a little bit about... Um, where you live now and um and why you live there and and that's kind of how you and i uh, have kept in touch all these years right yeah so i grew up in wisconsin that's actually where i started my fishing when i was really young my mom took me fishing for the first time on a farm pond up in wisconsin and one thing led to another through all the bass casting kids programs junior programs that i got some national recognition in the fishing industry from a very young age and I was blessed with amazing parents, and they actually decided when I was 12 years old to move down to Arkansas for my fishing. And so they got some jobs down there and relocated so I could pursue a career in fishing, even though I was only 12 years old. And that's actually where the headquarters of a BASS was, at least for the television broadcast. And so I was down over all the time over at the Bass Studios recording right. studios and stayed in touch with you there that whole time. So that's right. I love that. And I, I thought your fishing life was going to go in a different direction. And uh, we'll talk about that some as we go along here, but tell me right now, just kind of explain to the people that are watching or listening, what you do and, and how you do it. Yeah. So right now I'm actually a full-time fishing instructor, which is a little bit weird because that's not something that, really exists in the fishing space right now. For those who know about golf, the way I always explain it, it's not like the Hank Haney of bass fishing. Hank Haney is like a world-renowned golf instructor. He's the coach of like professional tour players, stuff like that. And that's how I like to think about myself. I am a coach for bass fishermen. How do you do that? Yeah. So really the way that I do that is by using virtual lessons, kind of like we're meeting here on a Google Hangout or a Zoom call. And I can also do virtual classes online as well as give different sorts of teaching materials and PDF formats, PowerPoint files. And I can also do lessons in person uh, through Bass Camps, things like that. So I am able to meet with people in person, virtually, and also through my YouTube channel, which is kind of what started growing my business. And so I offer free content on YouTube to train people in fishing and teach them all the things that a lot of the pros maybe know about really well, but are unwilling to share just because it's the trade industry secrets. Is a lot of your coaching or one-on-one -on -one instruction, is it how to fish or is it, or is it other things? Yeah, so most of it is really understanding how a bass ticks, like how a bass behaves, how it behaves throughout the seasons, throughout the years, and 
how to locate those fish on any lake around the country. And so I create a lot of frameworks. I'm very uh, systematic, almost like kind of an engineering mind when it comes to fishing. And that's how I always think about fishing is it's kind of like creating a demand forecast for a real t- retailer. You take all the factors that are out there, the weather, time of day, area you're in, all those things, put it together. If you can get all those factors lined up correctly, you can find fish. And so I like to teach people that mindset, which really seems to help people find a structured approach to fishing rather than just seeing random bits of information here and there, going to the lake and then being completely confused. I like to make it structured and simple for people. Okay. And so speaking of retail, let's talk for a minute about your background and um, because you were a business major, right? Correct. Yeah, I got my, uh, I have two majors in economics and supply chain management from the University of Arkansas. And I also got my MBA from the University of Arkansas with a concentration in marketing. And then you went to work in the business world. Yep. Yeah. So I worked in uh, the supply chain field with Nestle USA and Kraft Foods doing logistics and demand forecasting, things like that. And then I transitioned after my MBA to working with Nielsen, the TV ratings company, and I actually supported Walmart's digital marketing team doing all of their, uh, their audience analytics and research into their audience in terms of what their demographics are and how to reach people through digital media. You know, you just blow me away. You're so smart. And, and all of this is, is, is done online, right? Yeah, I do all of it through my YouTube channel, Fish the Moment, as well as on my website. And I have some other platforms I actually have a crowdfunded platform where I can have people oh. support me giving monthly donations, which is really cool. All kinds of ways to make That's money. That's cool. Well, how did that experience working in the corporate world, and you are at some incredible brands, but how did that inform your journey into being a professional fisherman? Or not, I'm sorry, you're not a professional. Well, you are a professional fisherman. You're just in a, in a different way, right? Yeah, I, I guess it's one way to think about it. I'm not fishing on a professional tour. That's always a big debate among professional anglers. Right. What makes a professional fisherman? Is it someone who makes their living fishing? Is it someone who is fishing on a professional tour, Bassmaster Classic, FLW Tour, Major League Fishing, stuff like that? But really, for me, I found my niche in the fishing industry by taking the business route. I had the opportunity when I was younger to fish professionally. If I really wanted to, I had sponsorships from a really young age. Uh, I was really fortunate to have that. I kind of got in at the front end of that, which is kind of crazy to look back on now. But basically, the way I think about it is that you can either go the professional fishing route, which takes a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort. It is a great route for a lot of guys who, if you just love to fish and that's what you want to do every single day of the week, that is the best job in the world for you. And I know there's a lot of guys who just love that. That's their Mm -hmm. passion. They can fish every day of the week. They are just happy as can be. For me, I am not one of those guys where I I like to do lots of other things other than just fish. I do business. I like to do dig into analytics and data and teach and all these different other things. And so I realized when I was in college and when I was kind of making the decision to fish professionally versus work in the business world, I found that I just like fishing, you know, for a hobby more than for every single day of my life to make my living. And fortunately, I was able to take my experience in college, and corporate world, and combine them together so that I can fish and do business at the same time, which is just a huge blessing. I could not be happier with the way it all worked out. I love that. I love that. All right. Well, we're going gonna, gonna to take a break here for really quick. You know, I say these, I'm going to take a break like I have a commercial break when I don't <laughs> really have a commercial, but I, I just, I, I advertise for myself. Okay. Maybe one day I will have yeah. commercials, but uh, we'll take a break and reset. We'll be right back with Johnny Schultz, who is a virtual, I'm going to give you a bit, I'm going to give you a bigger title. He's a virtual fishing coach. That, <laughs> I think that sounds good. Yeah, that's great. Hey, if you're enjoying this podcast, check out fishingbusinessschool.com where you can see video uploads of the podcast as well as my blog where I give you more practical advice on the business side of fishing. Fishingbusinessschool.com. Come see me over there. So we're back on the Fishing Business Podcast with Johnny Schultz, and I've known Johnny since he was about... Oh, three years old, not that long, but almost really, almost. Yeah, that long. for sure. And uh, Johnny is a fishing instructor. He's really built his business on YouTube, 
And I want, or at least I say that you may disagree with me, Johnny, but um, I really wanted to introduce you guys to him because I feel like there's a lot of different paths you can take to working in the fishing industry. And Johnny has certainly blazed his own path. And uh, so listen, at a very high level, uh, because you still, do you still have sponsors? What describe your relationship between your partners and your sponsors and, and, and what part of the marketing puzzle you solve for them? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because the way that media has grown over the years and developed is kind of outpacing the fishing industry a little bit. And actually, like I mentioned earlier in the podcast, that I had 11 sponsors that were at a high level since I was 11 years old. So a lot of the big names in the industry, and I'm actually not working with any of them right now. So even though I still have great connections with all of these companies and I am consistently uh, communicating with them, I'm not actually working with any of them. And what I find is that a lot of companies in the fishing industry right now are still focused on your traditional media platforms. So your TV and maybe your internet, like blogs, vlogs, stuff like that. And they're maybe getting into some of the social media on you know, the kind of frontier of that in the fishing industry, but they're not as advanced as the rest of maybe the bigger industries, bigger sports industries in the world. And so I've started to partner myself with maybe a little more progressive companies. And the example is Tackle Warehouse. They're a great company that is an online fishing retailer and they partner with me to do these things called affiliate links, where basically if people click on a link on my website, on my YouTube video, whatever it is, I get a certain percentage of the profits from that link. And that's a great model for me as a influencer, social media influencer, as a fishing instructor. And it allows me to not have to pitch products all the time. That's one thing that's really big in the YouTube space on social media is being authentic. And it's very hard to be authentic when you're representing a brand and basically being paid to say this product is the best product. Even if you fully believe it, when you're being right. paid to say something on social media nowadays, it's just not, it doesn't come across as well as that authentic product promotion or product placement. And so I've tried to find ways to generate ready revenue for my business without having to do those exclusive sponsorships. You can actually show a product in use, how you use it, and then take the, your, um, your viewer through to a shopping cart somewhere. Exactly. And so it's very streamlined process and I can work now with any company or any bait on the market and generate revenue from using that product without actually having to work with a specific brand. And so for me, that works really well. Now for a professional angler, other people, those exclusive partnerships are invaluable and that's the way that they make Mm -hmm. their living. And so if I was a professional fisherman, that's the route I would probably take. But for my business, it's just not the right model to maintain that authenticity with the audience. Yeah, but it's really smart, I think. I think you're, I think you're doing a a really smart thing there because you're, then you're not always having to say, this is the best. You know, it's like, we hear that a lot on, on television and tournament coverage. This is the best, this, this is the best, that it's the best uh, bait. It's the best wire bait, you know, and you're not having to do that. Right. Yeah. And what I find too, is when I promote multiple products, it actually improves the, pitch for that product or the promotion for that product because I am using different brands. And so when I do use that one brand bait, whether it's a Strike King, a Mega Bass, a Zoom, that's the bait I'm choosing to use. And people are going to go buy that product more often because they know that that's the one I chose rather than just saying every bait I use is from this one particular brand. And I find that it actually improves that trust in me as a content creator. Yeah. Now you pretty much built your following on YouTube, right? Yeah. Yeah. Almost and exclusively. And uh, is that, is YouTube gone too far now? Can people still build an audience on YouTube or is that, you know, you missed the boat if you're not there now already? No, that's best. Definitely a misconception about YouTube. It's not that you're going to miss the boat. There's always a niche in the market that you can fill. And if you want to create videos and you want to put the effort in, you can definitely build a channel, build an audience. Mm-hmm. The one thing people don't realize about YouTube is that it is a very, very slow growing platform. So what I mean by that is I started my YouTube channel in 2016 and I started my channel in 2016 while I was doing my MBA and I made 60 videos between 2016 and 2018 and I had 3000 subscribers in two years. I spent eight hours a day editing or eight hours per video. 
I had 60 videos. That's almost 500 hours of editing time. And then I also spent about another 500 hours filming, learning how to use all the software, all that stuff. That's a thousand hours I put into my YouTube channel over two years to get 3,000 subscribers. And I was getting like 100 views a video. Wow. But then after you hit a certain threshold, you get that 3,000, 5,000 subscribers. There's an exponential growth to those YouTube following. And now, you know, after from year two to year three, I went from 3,000 to 25,000. Mm -hmm. And now from year three to four, I'm almost at 60,000. So that exponential growth kicks in, but it's a lot of work up front to grow that audience. Right. And you have to have a lot of patience and, and, yes. and discipline to do that when not that many people are consuming your content because you're putting in a lot of work and, and you feel, I'm, I'm sure there are times when you feel like, ah, oh, is this worth it? Yeah. And for me, it's really, I did it because I enjoyed it. I wasn't doing it for, to make money or to do a, yeah. make a living at this. That wasn't my initial goal. My goal was I wanted to share the knowledge I had about fishing with others. And even if a hundred people watch my videos, I was happy with that because I felt yeah. like I was helping those hundred people get better at fishing. And it just worked out that I was able to grow it into an actual business. Again, not my intention at all. My plan out of my MBA program was to go work in corporate, climb the corporate ladder, become a VP at one of these yeah. Uh, you know, suppliers for Walmart and retire and live my life. That was kind of my plan initially, but this opportunity just kind of laid itself in front of me and I yeah. couldn't say no. So the, when you say that once you hit a certain threshold, you're, um, you know, you start growing quicker, is that because of the way the algorithm works for YouTube? Yeah, it's really just how yeah, the algorithm works. Once you hit a certain threshold in terms of views and number of subscribers, your, your videos are then recommended more. So I the see. more your videos are recommended, the more chance people have to click on them. And even now, like I have certain videos where I'll post and I think it's a great video and it gets 10,000 views. Then the next video gets 100,000 views and the next video gets 4,000 views and the next one gets 50,000 views. So it's all over the spectrum just because of that YouTube algorithm. Now, do you keep like a, you know, uh, Rick Klein kept a database for years of, of what winning patterns in the water temperature and the air temperature and all that sort of thing. Do you keep any kind of notes like that that you refer back to? I keep notes on everything, whether it's fishing, it's my business, um, literally everything in my life. I, I'm a note taker. I find that more data, I'm a data focused guy. So more data I can take on anything is important. And if I can analyze that data over time, over a year, two years, three years, it makes me better. And that's what has been helpful with my YouTube channel is now I have 200 videos of reference in terms of thumbnails and titles. I can figure out here are the topics that are good. Here's the thumbnail that's good. Here's the audience I'm reaching, you know, right. what age brackets, what gender, what region of the country, all this data you can collect through all my different platforms. And I can then use that to focus my business and drive more views, more sales on my website, book more lessons, whatever it is, I can shift my strategy off that data. And you're a data guy if you worked at Nielsen, because that's what that is, right? Just a yep. bunch of, bunch all of data. data. Yeah. But a little more tactical, what are some of your favorite tools that you use for uh, producing your, your video? Yeah, so I'm pretty standard in terms of my videos. I always say that the best thing you can do about or when you're creating a video is create a good story. Mm -hmm. You don't always need to have the flashiest graphics, the flashiest um, camera work. As long as you're telling a good story and it's coherent and cohesive, that's really important. And for me, I do a lot of instructional content. So something that's really important for me is making graphics. And I make a lot of my graphics actually in PowerPoint and in Photoshop. So Photoshop is a little more advanced, but PowerPoint, pretty much everyone has if you have Microsoft Word. And I make a lot of graphics in PowerPoint. And I'll just take time taking pictures from the internet, just putting stuff together on a screen, almost like making a PowerPoint presentation. And so many people are visual learners, they're auditory learners, and then they right. also need to learn by doing. So I like to give an avenue for all learners to learn and put different kind of learning stimulus on the screen. And that's what takes so much time to edit my videos is I will say something and then I'll make a graphic that shows an object moving across a screen and all these different elements coming together. And all of the animation takes a long time, but that's what makes the videos really, oh, yeah. really impactful. So now did you did you take classes in college on on how to teach? No. So uh, my mom is actually an art teacher. And so it's kind of been, I think, in my blood since I was young. But I just always had a passion for teaching. I've been giving seminars. I gave seminars at the Bassmaster Classic when I was nine years old on the hog tank for Mercury. That's and great. I've been teaching kids camps. You know, I've tutored 
econometrics, micro and macroeconomic theory in college. So I just love teaching and tutoring. So that's always yeah. been my passion. Yeah. And that's honestly something I love even more than fishing, to be honest. Nowadays, like I love the fishing aspect of it, but I love to go fishing to learn so I can teach more. That's what I love. That's great. I love that you're already doing what you love and in, in really in two different ways in the fact that you're fishing, which you love and the fact that you're teaching, which you love. It's just a super, super, I love hearing this. This is really neat. Okay. So what kind of camera do you use? So I use just straight GoPros. So I have a GoPro Hero 7 and a GoPro Hero 5. And all my videos are filmed on GoPros, which is surprising to people because they always think that you need to have these thousand dollar cameras. You need to have a cameraman in your boat. For me, I've just found ways to be able to mount my GoPro, put it in place, and I just get the shots I need and I just make do with what I can do. I'm a single cameraman. I do all the filming, all the editing, all the posting. I'm a one man show. You, know? so <laughs> too. you have to figure out how to do that. And as you know, you know, there's ways to do it. It takes yeah. more effort, more time, but as long as you're telling a good story, you don't have to have 4K quality video or right. perfect camera work. I'm it's so more glad about you said that. Yeah. You know, I was brought up in the television production world where, um, you know, everything had to be the highest quality image and the best sound and the best net yeah. sound and all of that. But I think now people, especially if you're on the Internet, because, you know, people are much more forgiving of the quality of the video if the content is really good. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing I found even with my videos is I actually try to produce TV quality content but in terms of the storyline and the content within, not so much the production quality. The right. production quality, obviously, I do the best I can. And I will spend hours and hours trying to get as close as I can to that TV quality product. And really, that's because of my audience. My audience, which is surprising to a lot of people, as I'm 25 years old, most people would think my audience is my age and younger. That's just mm -hmm. the perception people have with someone my age. They see someone who's 20 they talk to 20 year olds. Well, if you look at my YouTube demographics over three years, 75% of my audience is over 35. 50% of my audience is over 55. So wow. I'm talking a lot to 55 and older year old people and they're used to that TV quality content. And so I try to get as close to that as possible just because I know my audience and that's what they want. And so I try to use really good audio. I have like lavalier mics to get good audio. I try to make sure the camera work isn't shaky. So there's ways that you can still get that good camera work, still get that good quality content without having $10,000 worth of camera equipment. Right. Um, audio is a, audio is a, is a hard thing with GoPros though, don't yes. you think? Yeah. There's actually a lot of really good small portable lavalier mics that now are out there. The one I use is the Rode Wireless Go microphone. It is $200. You can strap it to your body really easily. And then I have one that just connects into my GoPro pole and it lasts for five hours. I switch these lavalier mics out halfway through the day and it gives me closer crystal clear audio the entire day. So Love very that. simple. That's great. Fantastic for you. And actually GoPros shoot an incredible image. Oh yeah, there is perfect. It's, it's all you need really when you're starting out too. I mean, if you're wanting to start improving your video quality and things like that, I would always say do that once you've built up your audience, built up your subscriber base, and you're really good at your content. You can improve your content without spending a single dollar most of the time. That's you right. only need to spend the money when you feel like that's a limiting factor in your growth. You know, I heard Brian Latimer say the other day that he, and this was not too long ago, just a couple of months ago, saying that he had shot all of his YouTube videos. And I, I don't know how many followers he has, but he has a good following. Yeah. But he shot them all on his iPhone. He had just recently only gotten a, a, a different camera. He had done it all. He had built his audience using an mm -hmm. iPhone. Yeah, it's really interesting how people can do it. And people are a lot more forgiving in that sense, especially younger audiences. I would say like even Brian Latimer, he actually has a younger audience than I do. Even though he's older than me, he has a lot of people who are younger than 35. Yeah. And that was kind of who he's associated with in terms of on YouTube. He's worked with a lot of YouTubers who are in that demographic. And for me, I can't, um, I can't put out quality, quality, like or poor quality content. And not that Brian's content is poor quality. It's just, the audience is more willing to accept iPhone footage, maybe a little bit of shaky camera work, maybe some slip ups on camera. They're fine with that. That's the endearing part of the videos. And I love Brian's content because of it. And 
I would love to be able to make content like that too. But for me, it just doesn't work for my audience. I would not get any views if I did that sort of content. And so for Brian, it works great. And he also, he just does YouTube videos while he's fishing and he's on tour. He's not a full-time YouTube yeah. content creator. Right. And so I think there's a lot of fishermen who are trying to get into YouTube, trying to get into this and they get really um, intimidated by all the camera work, by all the editing. But a lot of people just want to learn more about professional fishermen. They want to be able to get their life experiences on camera and whatever you can do, just get that out there and put out a video. Sometimes that's enough, especially if your audience is willing to accept that quality content, go for it because you're still helping people. You're still growing your brand, you're growing your image and there's no reason not to do that. And so that's how I always think about it. Yeah, I agree. A hundred percent, man. And Hey, I tell you what, we're Johnny and I are getting together and we're going to, um, we are going to put together our top tools. Have you ever heard of Angie's list? Yes. Yep. Not me. Not, <laughs> not, not you, but the, uh, the but, Angie's list. Yep. But we're going to put together Angie and Johnny's list of some of our favorite tools that we use and that we recommend to you to use. If you want to get started and do more around video. I look forward to, to sending you all that and there'll be a link uh, here in the show notes that'll tell you where you can get that. Um, but so what, what is, uh, what is, how do you post? What do you, how do you edit your videos? Yeah. So I edit them with Adobe Premiere. So there's the Adobe suite to use Premiere and you know, that's just really the software is a little bit complicated to learn. I probably spent like a year trying to figure out how to do everything in there but it really does help once you learn all those different parts of video editing. And yeah. then after I just try to post out as much as I can really with YouTube and social media, the more you post, the better. One thing I've learned with my business is there's two different approaches you can take. You can go quality or quantity, and they're both very effective. If you want to go the quality route, it takes a lot of effort. You're only going to be able to put out like myself, one to two videos a week, but you can grow a very consistent audience base and a very loyal audience base, or you can go quality or not quality quantity. You can post a video every single day. And even though the quality of the videos may not be as high, you're getting out more content, which will create consistency with your audience and build their trust and loyalty in you that way as well. And so they're both viable ways to do it. For me personally, I like the quality route but the quantity route is just as effective. And I believe that it is just as viable a way to do it. And so I think that when you get into YouTube, you have to pick one or the other. It's either full quality or quantity. You can't really ride the middle very well. It doesn't work out. You either have to do one or the other. And then, you know, for a lot of people, this is perfect for just doing a quick, especially on social media yep. like Facebook or Instagram, just no editing. You know, just shoot live and talk and show and t show your uh, followers what's going on. Yeah, that's the perfect way to start building your audience too. If you don't have the editing skills, make a video. You can chop it up, post it. A lot of the best YouTubers who are making content about fishing on YouTube, they literally will set up a camera, talk to it for 15 to 20 minutes straight, turn off the camera, post a video, and they'll get 100,000 views on those videos. Right. And as long as your content's good, that works. And so there are so many ways to do it. And you can do that with uh, a GoPro too, because you can have an app on your phone where you can uh, quickly download what you just shot and then you can upload it right from your phone. Exactly. And so there's, there's just so many ways to do it. My way of doing it is the way I do it just because I am uh, very detail oriented and I like to make the production quality the way it is. And it's worked for me, but my way isn't the only way. And I learned from a lot of content creators across the spectrum. And so one thing I always recommend is if you're trying to get into YouTube or you're trying to get into social media, watch a lot of different content creators and see what content resonates with you, which content do you like watching the most and try to make the content you like watching or that you would want to watch because you're going to be a lot better at making that content. For me, I'm not great at making those videos where I just sit, talk for 20 minutes and post it with no editing. I don't like watching those videos though. So that's the reason why I don't make them, but a lot of people do. And if you like that style of content, make that style of content and just post a lot and you're going to get the same results as I am. That's how, kind of how it works. That's so cool. I love that. I really do. Um, who do you, who do you follow? Who, who would you say, here's, here's, here's a couple of people you ought to follow. So it's interesting because most of my content I watch is actually outside of fishing. Mm -hmm. So what I always recommend is find a topic that you're interested in that's outside of what you're actually working, the industry you're working in. So if you're making, let's say, fishing videos, 
maybe instead of watching fishing videos, if you're really big into golf, I used to watch a lot of golf instructional videos, or I like mm-hmm. watching video game videos. So I watch a lot of YouTube content creators who make video games or play video games. And I take a lot of things from those creators and I'll watch all different spectrums of those creators and kind of steal shamelessly from what they do well, what they have been successful right. with, and then take that into my fishing videos. And it doesn't right. need to be those two industries. It could be any other YouTube content that you consume. Just find something you like watching, watch a ton of it, learn from people who are doing the best at it, and then kind of steal shamelessly to bring it into the, to this industry. Right. And if you were, though, if you were putting a, like a mid-roll in or, or, or something like what you just described, how do you report that back to your, um, to your advertisers? N- normally, our ads are usually served off an ad server. So you're not serving them off an ad server. Are you just reporting back number of views after a certain time? So with YouTube, they actually have Google AdSense where they'll automatically serve ads into your videos. Mm -hmm. So that's the way that I do it. And it's just automated. So you can just say, put an ad here and you can't choose which ad to go in. So you can, you know, you can say there's a video at, or an ad at the three minute mark. Now you can also put videos within or ads within videos. That's actually a lot of the stuff I did when I was working with Walmart is these product placements. And that's a whole other topic to discuss of how to best optimize product placement in a video. Let's say I'm in a video and say, Hey, I love this storm wiggle wart. I just have one on my desk here. This is the best <laughs> crankbait in the entire world. Throw this storm wiggle wart. I'm sponsored by storm wiggle wart. Go buy them. And I, you know, I'm not, but I could make a video like that. And that could be one of your product placements. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that as well. That are effective, that are not effective, that make your audience yeah. say, I'm going to go buy it. Or like, Hey, this guy's selling out. Don't talk to this guy. Yeah, There's a right? lot of ways to do it. Right. Well, and we'll have you back on it some other time. So, and we, maybe we can talk about a little bit of that sort of thing, but, um, but it's, it's, it's interesting to me how a lot of it is just, you know, nobody can teach you some of these things. Some of these things, you just got to do them and, and figure it out. Oh yeah. That's so much of it. Even when I was working in corporate, a lot of times it's just, you know, a trial by fire, you get thrown in and there's a project and you're like, Hey, here's a, we dress America fashion campaign. And I'm like, I don't know anything about fashion. Like I have my fiance pick up all my clothes. I don't know anything about this whole clothing line stuff. You just have to do it. And I'm sure a lot of people who are working in business who are listening to this podcast can relate. And the only way you're going to learn is by doing. And even when I was like in my MBA program, a lot of the stuff I learned was maybe not that applicable when I was in the program. But now that I'm starting my own business, it's amazing how much I take away from all my business classes that I would never do even in like a regular corporate setting, just working, you know, for like a Nielsen or something. I have to use every ounce of my business knowledge I gained in college to be able to grow my business to diversify my revenue streams, make it work. So I'm not, you know, living out in the street or living in my right. boat on the lake. Well, you're definitely not doing that. You're getting ready to build a new house and get married like in two days, right? Yes. Yep. So I know you're not, uh, I know you're not close to living on the street. Um, all right. Here's a, here's a question I just like to ask people sometimes. If you had a million dollars to spend on your business, what would you do with it? Yeah, that's, wow. million dollars. <laughs> uh, well, I've, I've actually only been doing this business now. Actually, it's going to be a year next month. So I've only been doing this business for a year. So a million dollars, I don't even know where I would start. But I think the big thing from a perspective of like long-term, like five, 10 year plan for my business is I want to be able to really flatten the learning curve for fishermen. Mm -hmm. I feel like in the fishing industry, there's a lot of knowledge that's kept secret by professional anglers just because that's how they make their living. And it's completely understandable, but there's not a lot of people who are willing to give that information out. And those that are, a lot of times they're not teachers. They can explain the information in a way that maybe makes sense to themselves, but not to others. And so I would really like to find a way to create content that is easy to understand, but also flattens that learning curve of fishing. Whether that's bringing in professional anglers who I know are really good teachers and say, hey, I will pay you this much money a year to come teach rather than be a professional fisherman. And that's not maybe the most uh, smart from a business perspective. There's a lot of other things I could do an app or I could improve my website to make more money. Me, but I'm not in this to make a bunch of money. I'm in it because I want to make people better fishermen, give back to the fishing world so that people don't have to struggle for 12 years to learn how to read a fish finder or throw right. a jig offshore like I did. And I had to spend hundreds of hours in the water sucking to be yeah. able to finally figure out how to catch those fish. And so that's always what I like to do is give back for yeah. the community that did so much for me when I was growing up. 
You know, I, I love that about you because I, I feel like a lot of times people get to tend to sort of try to hoard information or knowledge. And, and I just have more of a abundancy mindset that, you know, there's plenty for everybody and there's oh, yeah. plenty of business for everybody and, and there's enough to go around. And if we all kind of shared our knowledge, um, we'd probably all be better off. Um, yeah. So Johnny, your uh, channel is called Fish the Moment, right? Correct. Your YouTube channel is Fish the Moment. How, where does that name come from? So actually I was thinking about starting a YouTube channel when I was again in my senior year of college going into my MBA program. And I walked into my parents' house and we were, I think it was Christmas break or something or summer break. And I was like, Hey, I'm going to start a YouTube channel. And my parents are like, you're never going to do that. You're not going to make videos every single week. That's a lot of work. You already are trying to get a 4.0 in college. Like you're not going to do that. And I'm like, no, I'm going to do it. And so we <laughs> sat down like, okay, well, what, what should we do for the channel name? And a lot of people were thinking about like, um, I don't remember what they, they're talking about, like, I think we're talking about Johnny Schultz fishing and like fishing with Johnny and stuff yeah. like that. Johnny Schultz outdoors. Yeah. yeah like that's what those, everybody does. Yeah. And I was always thinking, well, one, Johnny is spelled J O N N Y. That's hard to spell. No one's going to get that right. It's not going to be easy to spell. And as we were having this discussion, there was a major league fishing rerun on the television that I was watching. And Micah Canelli was like, man, you got to fish the moment, catch those fish, go down the bank, you got to fish the moment, fish the moment. He said it like four times earlier on the show. And I was like, fish the moment, fish the moment. That's perfect. And like immediately I went on, like got the YouTube channel, got all the social media pages, got the website. I was like, this is it. And uh, that was just, it was Mike Iconelli on Major League Fishing. That was how I came up with it. So, And it really, you know, from a concept standpoint, it makes sense too, because you're, you're what I take from it is that if you, you're teaching people not how to, uh, you know, you're not just a, a specialist at, at spinnerbaits or you're mm -hmm. teaching people how to read the water, read the conditions and, and figure out what to do in those conditions, right? Yeah, I mean, that's one of my other mentors, Rick Clun. He has helped me a lot over my fishing career and he is so great at doing exactly that, reading the water, understanding fish behavior. That's why he is the best angler, greatest angler of all time, especially of his era. And I think that is misunderstood by a lot of people nowadays too, who are getting into fishing. They always want that quick fix, whether right. it's buying that $3,000 fish finder or buying that $20 bait or getting that right rod, whatever the people on television, the pros are telling you to buy. At the end of the day, what really matters in fishing, at least in my opinion, is understanding how fish act. If you understand how, why the fish is feeding, the motivations the fish has, and what conditions cause that fish to do what they do, you're going to be way more successful than someone who has the perfect bait with the perfect line and the perfect rod. And so that's always how I've thought about fishing. You can go fish with a cane pole with a spinnerbait tied on the end of it from 1960 and outfish people if you know when and where and how to be there. Love that. I love that. And if you guys want to be uh, taught any of those skills. Johnny is your man. And um, like you said, his, his channel is uh, Fish the Moment on YouTube. We're going to take a real quick break again, and we'll be right back with, uh, with Johnny Schultz from Fish the Moment, the virtual fishing coach. I was trying to use my best radio voice there. I really want to hear from you to know what kind of questions you have and how I can serve you best in this podcast. The easiest place to reach me is probably at Facebook or Instagram, where you can find me as Fishing Business Podcast or on YouTube, but you'll have to search for me there by typing in Fishing Business Podcast. Holla! We're back on the Fishing Business Podcast. Our guest today, of course, is Johnny Schultz, and we've had such a great conversation with you here today. I hate to, I hate to even wrap it up, but before we go, I wanted to say, uh, I wanted to ask you, who is a person in business that you has been influenced by? Yeah, it's interesting because it's not someone who's actually helped me from like a tactical or strategic perspective in my business. It's actually my fiance, Hanyel. She was the oh. one who actually got me to take the leap to even do my business in the first place. And yeah. That's great. You know, I think there you cannot. I'm so glad you said that, Johnny, because you cannot underestimate um, the value of having someone in your life who really believes in you and encourages you to to take the leap. Right. Yeah, it was really funny, actually, because Hanyel started her own business and left Walmart as an engineer 
about three weeks before I met her and wow. she did her own business and I met her and we just started talking. And within the first two or three weeks that we were dating, I told her I could never leave corporate to start my own business. I'm way too risk averse. It's something I could never get myself to do. You know, I was making a really good salary. I was on track to make, you know, a really, really good salary over the years. And I'm like, I can't just give up that security. And then one year later, just after talking with her, seeing how successful she was with her business, her mentality about being an entrepreneur, she completely changed my perspective and literally changed my life. She's the reason I'm doing this business now and I love it. And, um, you know, I would say that she is the most influential in terms of my business. And you really need someone like that a lot of times to give you that kick and to be there to support you, whether you fail or not. I mean, if I didn't have her to support me in this, I would never be able to take that leap of faith. So. I love that. I love that. And that's why, like I said, you're getting married in four or five <laughs> days here. So yeah. that's great. Who is your favorite person or brand to follow on social media? Yeah, I, li- I really like looking uh, or following a lot of the bait companies. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of them out there that I follow, but it's like 13 Fishing has a great YouTube channel they have, or a social media page on Instagram. Uh, there's a few others I follow that they'll just post interesting pictures of baits and scenery. Yeah. And they actually give me a lot of good ideas in terms of camera angles of how I'm going to make thumbnails and stuff like that. So I follow a lot of the bait manufacturers. Also just kind of stay up to date um, with the newest baits and trends. So I, that's just a little personal thing I like to follow. How has, has, has social media been important for you building your audience on YouTube? Or so I mean, YouTube is social media, but have Facebook and Instagram been, been important to you? So not really, actually. I, it's funny. I have uh, close to 60,000 YouTube uh, subscribers and I have 3,000 followers on Facebook and 2,000 followers on Instagram. Yeah. And it, it seems like the followers on different social media platforms doesn't transfer to YouTube. I think the main reason for that is because of my audience age. Again, right. it's mainly 35 to 65 year olds with more like 55 to 75 year olds is like my core audience. And so they're not on Instagram. They're not on, um, they're on Facebook somewhat, but not really every day. Yeah. And so a lot of times they just get onto YouTube and that's their social media. Right. Otherwise they're watching TV, reading the newspaper magazines. I don't, I don't know what everyone does that age, but, um, you know, yeah. Well, and plus YouTube is owned by Google, right? Yeah. So, yep. so that, so if you're Googling, uh, you know, how to fish a, uh, crankbait in the fall, you're going to get some, you're probably going to get some YouTube videos that come up, right? Exactly. And yeah, mine will be one of the top ones that pop up just from Google search. So yeah, right. it helps a lot there and, too. And that's how, I'm sure that's how a lot of your um, subscribers are finding you and they're not seeing those, those search results are not coming up with a Facebook page. Exactly. And one thing that's also interesting about YouTube, especially with my audience, is that I only have like 23% of my viewers who watch consistently or subscribe to my channel. So I have 50,000 subscribers, but really I have a lot bigger audience that's watching consistently. It's just that a lot of people don't even know how to make a Google account or a Gmail account to go subscribe. And they don't understand what the importance of subscribing is. Exactly. So for me, I always focus on views, but it's interesting because a lot of manufacturers, and if there are manufacturers listening out there, don't always just focus on that subscriber number. A lot of YouTube channels that are out there I see have, especially fishing, they'll have a hundred to 200,000 subscribers. But if you look at their average views per video, they're going to be getting three to 5,000 views, even though they have 150,000 subscribers or a channel like mine has 50,000 subscribers, but I'm averaging 20 to 50,000 views every video. And so it's more about the views because that's what you really want is the impressions. Subscribers is just a number. The impressions of the views, that's what really drives your business, drives your sales, whatever it is. Right. But you can't, uh, a brand can't, or, or someone, I can't go to your, can I go to your YouTube channel and see how many views a video had? Yeah. You can just scroll, okay. scroll through my video page and you can just yeah. look and see every video, how many I'm getting. You can just kind of average it up. Yeah. Um, just a quick, some quick math. Love that. Love that. Okay. Best business advice you'd give to somebody trying to start out? Number one is, I have two, I think. Number one is know your audience. That is the number one thing. And I know that that's your top tips. This can be on Angie and Johnny's list as well. <laughs> know your audience. And for me, that is the core thing, especially as we're talking about, like with me, you would think my audience would be 25 year olds, 30 year olds, but it's not, it's 50 plus. And so if I didn't know that about my audience, my content would be very different. And I think a lot of people go into the social media content creation phase and they start making videos for a specific audience, but then they realize their audience is very different and they never actually associate 
the type of audience they're making content for versus who's actually watching their videos and they don't grow as fast because they've never really honed in. And even when I'm making like changes to my website, introducing new products, making social media posts, whatever I'm doing, I have a person in mind. So it's very specific. So for example, for me, my person is a 50 plus year old person who worked in corporate for 20 to 30 years, had kids, fished when they were younger, was had to give up fishing because they were either getting married, they had kids, they had their job. They're now getting back into fishing, are either recently retired or their kids are just getting out of the house. They have all the money in the world to spend on fishing and the time, and they want to learn to fish. That's how specific my audience is. And I try to make, I, I have a person in my head who I try to make my videos for, and it's that specific. If you're not that specific with your audience, a lot of times you can't be very successful unless you're a massive corporation with like, you know, huge reach. Right, because you can't be everything to everyone. You need to niche down and be really important to a certain group. But I'm sure you didn't start your YouTube channel thinking it was going to be 50 to 70 year old people, right? I mean, <laughs> no, it's probably, no, you no. have to get, you have to actually take action. You have yep. to develop content and then you have to see what resonates and who it resonates with and then amplify that, right? Yep. It's just always with that strong focus of find your audience for the first two years of YouTube channel. If you start a YouTube channel, find the audience. That's your biggest goal. Not getting views, not getting subscribers. It's find your audience. Once you've identified your audience, then you can get that exponential growth along with the algorithm. God, I feel like I could just talk to you all day, John. And I do want to, we'll do it again. We'll, uh, we'll, yeah. we'll get our uh, Angie and Johnny's list together. We'll give it out to you guys and to our best tips and hacks for um, creating video. And then you guys let me know or let Johnny know what else you'd like to hear us talk about. And we'll have Johnny back because he is a, he is a boy wonder. And I've always <laughs> thought that about him. I mean, I, you're not a boy, but you are sure a young visionary, in my opinion, in the in the sport of fishing. And I'm and I'm glad we had this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you so much for being here, Johnny. Well, thank you for the opportunity to and I appreciate uh, you bringing me on the podcast. And it's just exciting to be able to hear more about your upcoming projects, trying to build this like fishing business school. I think it's an amazing yeah. idea. I think it's something that's needed in the industry. And I am really just excited to see what you do with it. And I know you're going to do an awesome job. So thank you so much. We'll talk soon. Yeah. Talk to you soon. I love that y'all. Johnny is such a neat kid and what a different way to work in the fishing industry, doing what he loves and, and being very, very successful at it. Um, I really am impressed with him and I can't wait to see what he does next. Now, like I mentioned there, we have a freebie for you. Johnny and I got together and made a freebie of uh, our favorite tools and tricks and tips and hacks for making video. You know, I was in a video producer for years and years and years for ESPN. Johnny obviously makes his living as a, as a video content producer for YouTube. And so we've got some things we want to share with you. If you'll go to fishingbusinessschool.com slash Johnny Schultz, that's fishingbusinessschool.com slash J-O-N-N-Y S-C-H-U-L-T-Z you'll find a download there of our favorite hacks. I'll also put it at fishingbusiness.com slash Angie and Johnny's list. How about that? That's easier. Fishingbusinessschool.com slash Angie and Johnny's list. And then you can download that freebie of our favorite tools. I think you're going to like it. I can't wait to see what you guys do with it. Um, again, come see me at Facebook at Fishing Business Co Podcast. I'm on Instagram, Fishing Business Podcast. And, uh, and of course, fishingbusinessschool.com. Uh, let me know what you think. Comment on YouTube. Comment on on, uh, on Apple iTunes and, and let me know what you're thinking about this and what I can do to serve you better. I'm going to sign off now the way Jerry McKinnis always signed off his show, The Fishing Hole. This is dedicated to Dad because he always had time to take me fishing. Thanks, y'all. See you next time.